Well, it's always interesting to be introduced by Julio, a man who has all the integrity and honesty of Abraham Lincoln and all the charm of the man that shot him. <laughs> Would like to add my congratulations to the top 100 uh, folks here. This is, a, this is great to live in a community where the people not only run a business but are very much involved in the community and uh, everybody here is very much indebted to you for the jobs you provide and also for your, uh, for your civic, civic activities. That's very, very, very special. Special to me today, this, this is a fairly rare occasion. My wife is actually in the audience. My wife, Peggy, is actually in the audience. When she rarely, uh, when I tell her I'm going to speak, she said, I've heard you speak. And uh, so that's always kind of, she's a tough, tough gal. We were, we had just finished up this new uh, addition in our backyard. We had this nice little outdoor kitchen that she designed and had built. And we were out there having a glass of wine. And uh, I heard her say, I love you. And I turned to her and said, Peggy, is that you talking? Or is that the wine talking? She said, that's me talking to the wine. <laughs> We've had a great marriage. We've been married for 40 years. And, uh, and you don't be married 40 years without uh, doing well with each other. Uh, we have had our moments. Uh, we, had, we had this one drive up near the, sometimes we like to just get in the car and just drive up around St. Francisville. And uh, you know, finally see some hills and some trees and, and all this sort of thing. So we're driving around, and we just had this little spat. And so she was on her side of the car, I was on my side of the car. We're both being kind of, you know, not talking. And we passed this uh, farm, and this farm had some mules and some chickens and some goats and some pigs out there. And I looked at her and said, "Relatives of yours?" <laughs> she said, "Yeah, in-laws." <laughs> so tough, uh, tough gal. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on out there in the economy. Uh, I want to talk to you about what's going on in the Baton Rouge area, of course. This is going to be a good place to be. This is going to be a good place to be over the next couple of years. There are some problems that we're going to have, and one of the biggest problems is what's going on in the national economy. The national economy, if you kind of think of our economy as like a ship that's going forward, one of the problems that we have right now is that we're dragging an anchor. Uh, we are now in uh, the worst recovery that this nation has been through uh, since the Great Depression. Uh, this has been the slowest. It's kind of like we went in one side of a V, we're coming out of it like a kindergarten L. Uh, it has not been a very good recovery at all. Uh, that, of course, is one of the things that's going to usually very much impact the, uh, the election uh, on, on November the 7th, because as uh, Bill Clinton uh, famously said, it really is your pocketbook that you vote. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how this election turns out. What I want to share with you are some forecasts for what's expected to happen in the national economy. And this is kind of one of the background things that we look at when we talk about where, you know, what's going to be driving the Baton Rouge economy. I have some forecasts here from Wells Fargo. Uh, a very, uh, there's a, they have an economics department that since uh, the recession ended has done a very good job of forecasting the direction and the, uh, the, the size of the recovery. And then Consensus Forecast USA, which I've shared with you many times, is an average of about 45 different forecasting firms in the country. Now, the good news that you see up here is there are no red numbers. And neither one of these groups is forecasting a recession on the horizon unless the fiscal cliff is not taken care of. Fiscal cliff is not taken care of, then Wells Fargo for sure is forecasting we will go into recession in the first and second quarter of this year. So that's kind of the good news. I mean, right now, you can see these are not good numbers. If you want to go in one side of a V, come out the other side of the V, you have to have real gross domestic numbers that are sixes and sevens and eights and fives. Uh, and if you might say, well, we, we, how is that possible? We'll go back to the early 80s. When we came out of that terrible recession in the early 80s, we came out of it with sixes and fives and sevens. With, you know, with growth rates like this, we're going to have a real problem uh, moving forward. It's going to be just a drag on our economy. It's kind of like we don't, we're kind of lost, if you like, which I have some new experience with, by the way. I had to give a, a speech uh, last week in Marksville at the casino. So I said, you know, I'm going to take the little, you know, Highway 1. I'm going to go up Highway 1 to get to Marksville. So I'm heading up Highway 1. Well, I get to uh, oh, uh, Morganza. In Morganza, this big, long line of trucks and people can't get on their way to Simsport. Well, there's working on the road up there. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drop back down. I'm going to hit something called LA-10. And I'm going to take LA-10 across to Melville and then go back up to Simsport and avoid all this stuff. So I go down, I get on LA-10. I don't know if any of y'all ever been on LA-10, but there's a point when LA-10 turns into a gravel road. 
And then there are no signs any place. No signs any place. Looking for signs. I could finally I saw this farmhouse and a guy out there kind of rocking on the front of his porch. And I said, I'm gonna get me some directions. I'm lost here. And I noticed as I walked up to this guy that there was this pig running around. Looks like apparently they're one of the kind of family pets. He's very, very tame. Only had three legs. And so I asked the guy, you know, how do I get out of here? And he said, well, you, what you're going to have to do, go all the way back down to 190, hit 510, go up to Sinsport that way. And I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very nice guy. I said, by the way, I noticed that you have a pig here that's only got three legs. Well, I said, what's the story behind that pig? He said, well, this is a very special pig. He said, this pig right here, see that pond out behind my house? My three-year-old son got in that pond accidentally and was drowning, and that pig grabbed him by the collar and pulled him out and saved his life. I said, man, so... He said, not only that, my five-year-old daughter was walking around the corner of the house and saw a rattlesnake. Rattlesnake was like this. That pig came up behind him, grabbed that snake by the neck, killed that, saved my daughter's life. And then we had had lunch here one day, and we're going to have, we're going to go to sleep after lunch, take a little nap. My wife had left a pan on the stove, and it got on fire. And that pig smelled that, and that pig squealed, came around, and woke everybody, saved everybody's life. I said, man, that's an amazing story. How come he has only three legs? And the guy says, you know, with a pig that special, you don't eat him all at once. <laughs> so anyway, now, what else is going to be the key thing that's going to be driving our economy? We're doing way better than the national economy is doing right now, by the way. We're doing, Louisiana is one of only two states in the South where employment today is higher than it was in 2008. Louisiana actually began to set record levels of employment in this state back in May, as I will show you a little bit later on. One of the key things that impacting our area is what's going on with the natural gas uh, prices. Natural gas prices, as you can see here, back, if you went back into the uh, mid-2000 time period, we had about seven years in which the price of natural gas was very high. And that was very, very, we thought we had a shortage of natural gas in this country. Do you all even remember that? We were talking about a shortage of natural gas. And then, suddenly the price of natural gas has come down, and it has come down a lot, and we think it is going to stay down. As you can see here, we think the price of natural gas is going to average about $2.25 over the next two years, uh, around a range of $2 to about $3 uh, per million BTU. Now, you might say, I picked up the Wall Street Journal today, and right now it's at $3.47. But you need to remember, the price, these are annual averages. The price of natural gas is like a double hump camel, right? It's really high in the winter months when we're using natural gas to heat our homes, and it goes down in the spring. It goes up really high in the summertime, like where we are now, because we're using natural gas to generate electricity to cool off our homes. Then it's going to go down again in the fall time period. But anyway, it has come down, and it is, why, you might ask, why has it come down? Well, it's the price of something, right? It must be because of supply or demand. And as it turns out, it's almost totally a supply-side phenomenon. And that is because, by the way, there's something interesting about your country. You just watch, you just watch it. Anytime the price of a commodity goes up, anytime we run into a shortage of some commodity, you smart, clever, greedy capitalists will go out and either find more of it or you'll find a really cool substitute for it. That's been our history of our country going all the way back to the Civil War time period. Now, what happened was, in the old days, we used to simply uh, draw a, uh, you know, uh, drill a well straight down and hit a gas pocket and bring the natural gas up. You might get two to three million cubic feet per day. When the price of natural gas got really high, we already knew there was natural gas in shale. The question was, how do you get it out? Well, let me tell you, when the price of natural gas was $10 per million BTE, you figure out ways to get it out. So what they did is they figured out a way to drill straight down, like if this is the Hainesville shale, they would drill down vertically 14,000 feet. They would then go vertically about 4,000 feet, and in the vertical portion, they would explode little holes in the pipe, and then they would send a lot of water, a little, a, some sand, and a little bit of chemicals down there under very high pressures, and they would frack that, natural gas, that, that shale, and natural gas would come out. Instead of producing two to three million cubic feet per day, there are wells in the Hainesville shale producing 28 to 30 million cubic feet per day. I mean, just a tremendous amount of natural gas uh, came on board. Now, those of you who are Ole Miss graduates, this is a map of the United States of America. <laughs> the really good news is there are these shale plays all over the United States. Now, that, I can't tell you how important that is to Louisiana, because in the past, when it came to energy policy in Washington, D.C., there were really only about four states, maybe five states, where uh, oil and natural gas were really produced. 
And so when the other 45 states were saying, you know, go ahead with this dumb energy policy, it doesn't matter to us, it doesn't affect us. Now it's happening all over the United States. Now everybody's got some skin in the game, and that has mattered a lot. And as a result, because of all these plays, you've seen a lot of natural gas come on the market. Now, this is critical to our chemical industry. You're, you're sitting in a metropolitan area that has the highest concentration of chemical industry employment in the state. These low natural gas prices are important to us for three reasons, to the chemical industry for three reasons. Number one, they are huge consumers of natural gas. You know, they are way bigger consumers than you commercial people are, or certainly you residential people are. Residential, commercial, industrial is way the heck up here. And so it, the, the price of one of their major inputs has gone down. And some of, their, some of their products, like ammonia fertilizer, is actually made out of natural gas. Okay? And matter of fact, we're starting to see new ammonia plants opening up in our state as a result of these low prices. Out of natural gas, you produce ethane, and out of ethane, you produce ethylene, and out of ethylene, look at all these consumer products that are produced that you consume out there. And number th the last thing is, it is a very clean burning boiler fuel. It's way cleaner than coal or fuel oil. So this is really important to this industry. Now the other thing that's important is this. The price of natural gas has gone down in the United States. It has not gone down in Europe. The green line there shows you what's happened to the price of natural gas in the United States. That red line shows you what's happened to the price of natural gas in Europe. And the reason that's important is that Europe is a huge producer of chemicals. Uh, back in the late 1980s, I had the chance to go visit a BASF plant in Germany. That one BASF plant in Germany was bigger than the entire chemical industry in Louisiana. It is huge over there. And the problem is over there, their natural gas, which by the way they get from Russia, they have to import it from Russia, their prices are way high and as a result of this, if you think of this big pie that represents the demand for chemicals in the world, the size of that pie has not been changing very much because the U.S. and the world economies are not growing very much. What is happening is our share of that pie is growing like crazy. We are kicking the behinds of the people in Europe and we're getting their market share. Now, uh, the third thing is if you go to those chemical plants in Europe, remember in the United States, we take natural gas, we make ethane, and out of that we get ethylene. In Europe, they take oil. And out of oil, they get naphtha, and out of that, they get the ethylene. Well, you know what's been happening to the price of oil. It has not come down like the price of natural gas. And as a result, if you look at this chart, it, the price to make a ton of ethylene in Europe is twice as much as it is in the United States. And as a result, once again, we are really, we are really doing very, very well here. Now, the biggest problem we have, you're on the chair of the board of any, or you're on the board of directors of any chemical firm in the United States, and you're looking at this great stuff that's happening. We're getting this big increase in the demand. The one thing that you really have to worry about is Europe also has a large amount of shale plays here. If you look at the kind of where these red areas are, Europe has a lot of shale too. Okay. The problem in Europe is that if you think the, the really extreme greens are powerful in the United States, you haven't seen anything like what they are in Europe. Uh, the greens in Europe have basically, in France has basically banned hydraulic fracking, Bulgaria has banned hydraulic fracking, and so one of the things we have to worry about is that as we keep eating into their share, they're finally going to say, as they say in Texas, hail, hey, this is stupid, okay, this is stupid. We can't keep losing these high paying jobs in the tenant, and what they're going to do, I think, ultimately, is start harvesting that shale, and when that happens, then our share is going to be, is going to be in jeopardy. Again, I think, the, the, I think the fracking thing is past the test of scientific, uh, of scientific impact, the scientific test of impact of the water supply. Sometimes it's very difficult to fail a test with dignity. I look like y'all need a little break here, so I'll show you how difficult it is sometimes to fail a test with dignity. Little kids, name one measure which can be put into place to avoid river flooding in times of intensive rainfall, for example, in Mississippi. Flooding in areas such as Mississippi may be avoided by placing a number of big dams uh, in the river. I love this one here. Little Peter was asked to expand A plus B. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> Find X. Here it is. Okay, I love that one. <laughs> Name six animals which live specifically in the Arctic. Two polar bears. And, oops. <laughs> three, four seals. How do you grade this one here? Where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? 
at the bottom. I mean, what do you tell the kid, okay? I love this. Now, as a result of this, you look at, this, look at, look at our metropolitan area. Look at the announcements that we know of already, and we know there are more coming. You know, Westlake Kimball, look at the size of these numbers. A half a billion dollar expansion down to Geysworth. Georgia Pacific, a $300 million upgrade. Air Liquide, smaller, but look at Shintec, a $120 million plant that they're building. Methanex is moving an entire plant from Chile to Ascension Paris. Look at that, over a half a billion dollar investment, 130 new jobs. SNF Polymer, which we've talked about before, is continuing their phased in expansion. They'll probably be adding 200 jobs over the next two years. BASF has now announced that they have a 120 million acid plant they're building and two surfactant plants. That's another 120 million, that's 240 million, a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, Honeywell, a smaller 33 million, but look at Williams as a $400 million expansion. Exxon Mobil just announced a $215 million expansion. And then you look at some of the, the groups that are coming along that feed into that, Emerson Process Management, a smaller capital investment, but about 90 jobs they make, make and refurbish valves for the chemical industry. DMC Carter Chambers, again, a valve company for the chemical industry, an expansion with 80 jobs. Now, by the way, one of the side effects of this, you watch, get, look, look on the internet about the East Baton Rouge Parish sales tax collection. Look at this number. Their sales tax collections from the manufacturing sector are up 33 cents, 33 percent in the first five months of this year compared to the first five months of last year. So it's really helped uh, the, the Kip Holden administration in terms of money coming in. Watch your industrial contractors. I think one of the hidden things is what Turner is doing across the river in Port Allen. I mean, look what Turner's done. Their pipe fabrication yard over there, looking at this stuff coming out, they've added 400 people in the last year. Of the, they've, to their modular yard, they've added 100 in the, in the past year, and there's a real prospect for that continuing to grow over there. Uh, performance contractors, you talk to Art Fabe, boy, they're preparing to really gear up here. Now, and especially starting right now, a lot of the engineering work is being done on these, and then you'll start the uh, construction effort in the second half of the, the kind of time period that we're in right now. Uh, Gabriel recently did a survey of all these companies and how many, how many people you're going to need and they're saying they're going to need about 6,400 more contract construction workers uh, over the next two years in order to meet this demand. And I frankly do not think this includes all the potential projects out there. So there's just a lot of really good work going on ahead. Now, it's not all chemicals going on in your state, your area. That's the other good thing. Emeritus, which is an information technology and software development uh, company that's going to be creating about 300 jobs over the next three years. That's good for us. The digital media area continues to grow. They already had about 400 people. They built this new facility out at LSU. They're going to add another 200. Trifigure down in, uh, uh, at Ormet's old terminal has already built a warehouse down there. They just about finished it, 100 new jobs. And then they've announced that they're going to build a one-third of a billion dollar new coal, uh, a fourth of a million dollar coal export terminal down here. That's a lot of new money. Of course, we just had the opening of the new casino. Now, what's going to be very interesting for us to watch is that they're hiring about a thousand people. What's going to be interesting to watch over the next two years is if we end up with a thousand net new casino workers in our city. Uh, as I mentioned to you in the past, I think that our community can only support two casinos, <laughs> two, two casinos, as it turns out. I really think one of the two downtown will ultimately go down, but this is a beautiful new facility out there. Quality Iron Fabricators um, has just added 100 jobs. They're getting ready to go in a second phase. They're, gonna, they're also going to create another 100 jobs. You're going to see a new Hampton, beautiful new Hampton Inn going in downtown that will open up soon. Uh, Personas, you saw the, the article in the paper about this. They manufacture digital analog hardware. Uh, built a new facility out on Highland Road, 65 new jobs. Our Lady of the Lake Livingston has just opened uh, their new facility, created 200 jobs over there. Uh, we are we're among the areas of the state. We have uh, over a half a billion dollars. Y'all probably didn't know there's some road construction going on here. About a half a billion dollars in road construction going on in our metropolitan area, not including the new, uh, newly announced facelift on the old uh, Mississippi River Bridge. Uh, that will start uh, and finish, uh, start it soon and, and finish soon. Uh, Our Lady of the Lake, if you've driven down Essen Lane, you can see the big cranes out there. They have a $200 million expansion going on there. Go out to LSU, they have, they're going to have a $75 million expansion at Tiger Stadium, and they're doing, going through the design phase of a $58 million expansion to the LSU Student Recreation Center. 
the film sector is doing very well. I got to meet some of the, uh, again, uh, say hello to some of the people, the Celtic or Celtic Studios people here. Uh, they, are, uh, they are getting, uh, they're in the midst of an expansion out there. Uh, Pixamondo, who is the, uh, won the Academy Award for Hugo, has now got a place out there, and they're going to be adding jobs uh, over our time period. In addition to that, uh, we have a number of, of, of firms that have said, look, we're looking at you, and we're, we're, we're doing some feasibility studies that come to you. There's not a small number of people. This new really neat one here, the uh, Avalon Rare Metals, is in the midst of a feasibility study. They have picked out St. James Par uh, uh, Ascension Parish. They want to build a $300 million rare earth element separation plant there, 175 jobs. We've talked about Point Bio every year for the last three years. Honestly, I don't know what's going to happen here. They've been uh, buying uh, options on land over at the port uh, to make wood pellets. Uh, that has not happened yet. I'm not really quite sure where it is now. Huntsman is looking at uh, a design study to increase the size of their plant. They haven't told us how much. Now, the one thing we want to watch very carefully is this area here called the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale. Going right, and this is, this is where you're going into the shale, not to get natural gas, but to get oil. This is one of the new developments is the shale gale in oil. Did you know that North Dakota is now the second largest producer of oil in the United States? They just went past because of the Bakken shale up there. Now, this shale play here, we had hoped by now there would be 30 to 40 rigs operating here. Right now, there's only about seven. When you do this fracking stuff, the fracking is not common across all fields. Each field has its own nuances, and the companies are still trying to figure this out right here. And the wells, where you go to the Bakken, it might cost $6 million to drill a well. Right now, it's costing about $22 million to drill a well in this. They haven't broken the code yet, but they're working very hard on that, and I think they're going to break that. So hopefully, when we get together next year, we'll have much better news to tell you about the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale. Other big potentials. I know if you talk to the people in the Baton Rouge Area Chamber of Commerce, the people down Ascension and others, we know of these three companies the, the, who have these names, the Happy Corn, I love this, Dashboard and Frontier. We're talking about some really huge potential investments in our area. A BRAC, uh, Adam Knapp was telling me that BRAC now has five highly likely announcements by the end of this year that total almost a billion dollars. And we're going to know soon on two other projects to be announced. Uh, the bottom line for the state of, for, for Bat Rouge is, uh, this is a pretty nice picture to be looking at here. You compare this picture to other metropolitan areas that you'll see in your booklet today, this is a really good place to have been. As you can see, we are for, and this is, I think, a very, very conservative forecast. If we hit on some of those big ones, these numbers are going to turn out to look sillyly, that's a word, conservative. Okay? Uh, we're anticipating about 9,000 new jobs over the next two years, an average growth rate of about 1.2, 1.3 million. And we think uh, by the time we get to the end of 2013, 2014, we'll have gained back all the jobs we lost during the Great Recession time period. I hope I'm communicating well to you. I know I'm now getting way older. Uh, than most people in the audience, and that always gets tricky. You start needing stuff more as you age. For example, I've discovered that I need glasses more at my age. Uh, one of my dear friends is here in the audience who will appreciate this one, but also I thought I'd show this one. Wine, cheaper than Botox and paralyzes more muscles. I think that's <laughs> important. And then those of you who are wine aficionados, I thought you would appreciate this. The secret to enjoying a good wine. Open the bottle to allow it to breathe, if it doesn't look like it's breathing, give it mouth to mouth. I think that's a good way to go. <laughs> now, what about the state as a whole? Let me very briefly talk to you about what's going on in the state. If you look at this chart, let me compare this to Baton Rouge, the chart we saw earlier. Okay? The state of Louisiana has not, it, it had a really tough time period since the late 1990s. If you kind of look at this line right up here, this is the 2 million job employment line. See the 2 million job employment line here? I mean, we will start to head towards that, and then something will happen. We started to head for it, you know, here initially, and then 9-11 occurred. Then we started to head for it again, Katrina and Rita occurred. We started to head for it again, and then the Great Recession occurred. Well, now we're starting to head towards it again. And uh, hopefully this time we will make it. Uh, actually, the state of Louisiana began setting employment records back in May. So we're actually doing much better. If I showed you a picture, if I showed you a picture here, I also keep up with Alabama and Mississippi and Arkansas. I mean, 
I mean, their lines came down very, very hard. They've, and they've had a very, very hard time period turning that around. If you look at our state, and what, if you read the, the report, there are certain negatives out there that are going to keep us from growing a lot faster. One of the negatives, of course, is the weak growing U.S. economy. The second is, uh, the, I'm glad I'm not talking to the New Orleans audience. I mean, New Orleans has got a problem going forward, and that is the closure of Avondale Shipyard. Avondale, at one point, was the largest manufacturing employer in the state with 4,500 people. This year, it will lay off another 1,700. By next year, it will lay off 2,000 and be totally closed. Man, it is tough to overcome 3,700 job loss. No matter how well you're doing on the other side, that's tough to overcome. Also, the General Motors plant in Shreveport was closed this past uh, uh, August, September. That was 800 jobs we lost. The other thing that is a problem is the Hainesville Shale flight. Look at this picture. The number of wells in the Hainesville Shale has dropped by more than 80%. And the problem is that, number one, uh, when you drill in the Hainesville Shale, all you get is natural gas. If you go to the Eagle Ford in Texas, the Marcellus Shale up in Pennsylvania, or to some of the other shale plays, you get not only natural gas, but you get oil, too. The price of oil is staying up there, right? And also, these are very deep, very expensive wells to drill. They might cost nine to $10 million a piece to drill, and the Eagle Ford is five to six million. So you're seeing these rigs just flee away from this area, which as you can say, I mentioned two things about the Shreveport area that are big negatives. You know, the Hainesville Shale and the, uh, and the closure of GM, that makes it really tough for that area to stay. On the positive side, we mentioned the low natural gas prices. That's not only good for us, that is great for Lake Charles, and it's also great for New Orleans. We've had the return of the Gulf of Mexico by, by the the first part of 2013, all the deep water rigs will be back in the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, Port Fouchon is blowing and going. Uh, the, sh the, the lease sales of the Gulf of Mexico have been very, very good. So uh, our fastest growing areas of the state, we think, will be the Lafayette area and the uh, Homa area. What? Again, I've never known a time in the 30-plus years we've been doing these forecasts when I've seen more potential new projects that will be announced between now and about February of next year. Uh, the biggest of them all is the Sasol company. Sasol is a company, uh, a South African company that is in Lake Charles. Uh, they are talking, they are looking at a $10 billion gas to liquids plant. They're gonna take natural gas, make just fuel out of it. They've worked that out. They're looking at a $4.1 billion ethylene plant. Remember the price of ethylene being low here compared to other places? Uh, Shell has already announced they're looking at either us or Texas as a place for another gas to liquid. There are five steel mills that are looking at our state. We're in the top one or two for five steel mills. And these steel mills are located all over the state. The other thing that's a positive, depending on where you live, if you're in, if you're in New Orleans or you are in the Homa area, I mean, you, you can't begin to appreciate how much money BP has pumped into those areas and is going to pump into these areas. In their first round, they pumped $1.6 billion into the Homa, uh, uh, mainly the Homa, New Orleans metropolitan areas. Now, to, 1.6, do you know they, spent, they pumped so much money into the uh, Lafouche Terrebonne area where, where Homa is, that increased their personal income 3% in one year. I mean, that is a big increase. Uh, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, which was closed in June, pumped $6 billion into the area. The Deepwater Horizon Class Actions Claim Unit was just set up down in New Orleans uh, is estimated to be uh, ready to pay out another $2.6 billion. The Restore Act, which is very much in the paper today, you know, BP is going to have a fine levied by the federal government, and right now that money is supposed to come back to the states that were impacted, like Louisiana. We don't know how much that money is going to be, but I bet it's in the B number, too. It's going to be a B number. And this does even include the claims that state and local governments have included. So just a whole lot of good, you know, just money that is coming in from that one source. Now, I hope that, uh, you know, the, the main thing is the, the, the difference between now and what we've talked about in 08, 09, and 10, some of these other times, is that we're not in a desperate situation. We're in a good situation. Desperate, I'm going to tell you a desperate story to end this today. There was a little old lady that was sitting on a bench in Miami, and this man comes and sits down on the end of the bench. And after a moment, she says, uh, are you from around here? He, he, he says, yeah, I am. She says, you seem like a stranger. And he said, well, I haven't been here for a long time. She said, well, where have you been? And he said, well, I've, 
I've actually been in prison. She said, well, why were you in prison? He said, well, I killed my wife. And she said, oh, so you're single. <laughs> I enjoyed being with you folks today. Thank you very much for coming out. Okay. <laughs>